you know, one thing that I do want to ask, and this might be a really naive question, so I apologize. No, 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 no. (laughs) But, you know, us as fans, I'm speaking more from a fan than obviously uh, analysts like you, but uh, we sit here and we're doing our mock drafts and we're doing the players that we'd like to pick and, you know, all of these types of things. And, you know, us as fan GMs never blow a pick. Like, we're like, we would have never picked that guy, right? We we never, zero busts from a fan GM, right? So, but we've seen some, you know, huge blunders. Uh, I've seen it from, you know, being a 49er fan. We've seen it, unfortunately, a multitude of times uh, having high picks and guys that didn't pan out. But with all of that information that you just uh, kind of talked to me about, it seems like it's such an in-depth process, Daniel. How do guys who are just the, the top, the cream of the cream, like you said, how are they still getting it wrong on certain players uh, during when it comes to draft day? That's a great question, uh, Sunil. I, I think what it comes down to is there's just too many variables uh, involved. And, and every team, especially a team like the Jets, I mean, you know, a lot of people in the NFL have plan A, B, C, and D, I've been told. A person like Bill Belichick has plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. I mean, just all the way through the alphabet, right? right. So they plan for everything, and they have they they go over all the variables in their strategy meetings and also through their thought processes. But there there's always the human element to it that there are some things that you just can't take into an account. You know, I mean, I think that's why when you see like. Like, you know, when, when Coach Bilicek, you know, drafted Aaron Hernandez, you know, mm-hmm. I think that's a classic example of this. Great tight end uh, talent out of Florida. I mean, Hall of Fame ability, I felt, watching him on film as a tight end. But there was some stuff going on behind the scenes. And so there's things that happen. And really, the kind of money these guys are making um, mm-hmm. is, is, uh, is a variable, too, because – you know, sometimes these guys come into the league. And I remember I was at the, I stayed in the rookie dorms my first, you know, right after I got hired in 1998, you know, by the Jets. They put me up at the dorms with the rookies. And the first mm-hmm. week, you know, they all rolled in their college beaters. You know, they, they had like, you know, it's like cars with three wheels. You know, Scott Frost from Nebraska rolled in with an old beater. It's so clever. Wow. <laughs> you know, all these guys had these old vehicles. And then like they get the rookie signing bonus and everyone's got to escalate a navigator, spinning wheels. Um, you know, so the money, you know, they say the money changes some players in the NFL too. Uh-huh. And, and you see that a little bit. So I think, you know, there's just too many variables involved to always be able to know, because like, to your point, you know, I've researched it too. I mean, 53% of first rounders are, are bust historically. And so, yeah, it does. It happens to all of us. It happens to the best of us. As a matter of fact, a little humility check for me, you know, when people say, well, you know, where'd you have Payne Manning, Manning ranked um, in 1998? I, I say, well, as my fourth ranked quarterback, to your point, like we all make yeah. mistakes, right? I had Ryan Leaf, number one. I had wow. Brian Greasy, number two. <laughs> I had Dan Gonzalez, number three, and Payne Manning, number four. Okay. Uh-huh. And, and, but at my saving graces, I always come back to, I said, listen, Hall of Fame general manager Bobby Bethard selected Ryan Leaf. I don't want to talk about the other guys. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm so, but I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of humorous because, right. I mean, if you're hitting 80% in the NFL, you are a superstar. Right. I'm definitely going to hold that uh, Peyton Manning thing against you later on in this discussion when we start talking about Trey Lamb. But uh, I might bring that up if I'm losing. So, uh, anyways. <laughs> hey, <laughs> so, hey, I, I set that up nicely for you, didn't I? I appreciate it. No um, problem. I do have one more question of what, before we move on. But, you know, there's certain, I guess, organizations or certain GMs that I've seen that have had a little bit more success, right? You look at, like, a guy like Ozzy Newsom who was, you know, the GM for the Ravens and just seemed to be able to pick the right type of defensive players and the the trenches, you know, whether it be offensive line, defensive line, linebacker, safety. He just seemed like he never missed when it came to finding Hall of Fame type talent. You look at the Pittsburgh Steelers and their ability to just draft receivers. It's like if they pick the receiver, you're kicking yourself in the butt if you could have picked them because, you know, this guy's about to be amazing because, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers picked, you know, that guy as a receiver. What do you think separates when it comes to these type of organizations or these type of just position groups that certain organizations just seem to be able to scout the right way, pick the right way? And, and why is it so hard to duplicate across the league into, into every, I guess, uh, draft room? 
That's a great question too, uh, Sunil. I mean, it, it's something where you you touched on some some of the you know internally inside the NFL. There's flagship organizations for scouting. You touched on two of them. You touched on the Baltimore Ravens, the Pittsburgh Steelers. You have the Green Bay Packers is another one. Uh, the Vikings were thought to be one for years. And uh, now, of course, Seattle, you have John Schneider up there as a general manager who was with the Packers for years. You have some of these organizations that are just rooted in scouting and grinding. And I think if I had if I was on a game show, I think it's it's in those organizations. Everyone comes up the hard way from what I've seen. Everyone starts as a, as, a, as a grunt, if you will. You know, everyone starts at the bottom and everybody grinds through the process. And all those organizations, a lot of times, especially, you know, I mean, I mean, look at Pittsburgh. I mean, it's the same guys every single year. It's the same, like the same type of linebackers, the same type mm -hmm. of running backs, the same type of players. Um, you know, it's, 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 these, it's just a, a way of doing it. And I think they look for people that are open to taking direction their direction and those are the people they bring in the scout and those are the people that get promoted through the ranks because if you notice a lot of times a lot of those guys get promoted you know coming up through the ranks they they earn their stripes so to speak Ozzy Newsome you know obviously a little bit different he was a hall of fame you know caliber tight end for Cleveland and he, he's a great you know personnel man as well you know probably you'll know, probably go in the hall of fame as a personnel guy too mm -hmm. at some point and uh so i think you know whereas a lot of other teams and the thing too is is you know i've had this conversation with scouting directors in the nfl you know we talk about systems and you know it, everyone gets caught up you know the, the west coast offense for example mm -hmm. um you know that was unique that that was bill walsh's you know since we're in a 49ers you know uh, nation here right it, it, that the, the the west coast was was bill walsh's some people would argue jerry burns would have had a part and role to play in it but but that was really bill walsh's brainchild and so he was able to do that and it was his, he was able to, because he, he knew what it was, he believed in it, he was able to sell it with, with conviction. The players believed that they did it. Other people, you know, in that organization, if you notice, I mean, the, the percentage of Bill Walsh, the success that he had versus all his disciples in different places, it's not even close, right? And so it's, it's, it's I think a lot of these different organizations try to take people from, you know, the teams you mentioned, the Pittsburghs, the Baltimores, these different flagship you know, organizations of scouting, and they try to duplicate this in other places, but it's not their system. It's not true to them. And so they may know parts of that system. They may try to do parts of that system, but it's not authentic. It's not them. So I mm -hmm. think they have a lot of harder time, if that makes sense, duplicating in other places, because any system in the NFL will win, I believe, as long as it's your system. Right. Kind of like, you know, we see that what uh, Bill Belichick was able to do with New England. And, you know, these coaches try to go out off their own, try to duplicate the same system, and they just kind of fall flat on their face because it has to be from the top to the bottom. I'm, I'm assuming ownership, you know, the GMs, uh, the coaching staff, the scouting departments, the players all have to be on the same page. It can't just be, you know, one or two people thinking the same way, right? Right. Absolutely.